Beverly Diamondstein. Welcome to Visions and Images, American Photographers on Photography. Today we'll be talking to Barbara Morgan. The play of rhythm in dance, in light, and in metaphorical thought has dominated Barbara Morgan's life's work. She has been a true innovator in her experiments with movement, the techniques of photo montage, and light drawings. Her best known works, the legendary photographs of Martha Graham and other dancers, are thought to be the quintessential statement on how dance may be looked at and recorded. A very warm welcome to you, Barbara Morgan. You said that photography was not an art, it's journalism. You said that more than 50 years ago, and I wonder if you can tell us when and what caused you to recant those words. As a student at UCLA, when it was just beginning, um, that was 1919, I hate to say it, I'm 80 years old, um, <clears throat> I, of course, was a major in art. And I, after I graduated, I was asked to be a member of the faculty, and I was the youngest member, and of course I painted. Well, I also got married to Willard Morgan, and before we were married, he never had the courage to say, why don't you photograph as well as paint? Why but, was he especially interested <laughs> in photography? Well, here we were, very much in love, but he was saying, photography will be the 20th century art. I said, you're crazy. Oh, you wait. And then he said, and photography will be the international language. What do you mean? He said, well, simply, a picture describes something without words. So if you take a picture of a cat here and somebody in China sees it, you don't have to say cat in Chinese. You, you've got a cat and so forth. Well. So we, How did you come to agree with him? <laughs> well, that's a real question. Uh, well, there are two, two answers to that one. We didn't have very much money, so he set up our darkroom and our bathroom. So every time I went to the bathroom, I learned about photography. Because there would be negatives hanging and dangling, and there would be prints washing and tr trays. And, and I, I said something simple like, now, you've got one dark here, and the same thing is light, so what's the meaning here? Then he would very eloquently describe the whole concept. Well, I'm experimenting, so I want to see how this dark one conveys a certain feeling, and this light one perhaps is better, and so forth and so on. Well, I never studied photography, I might add. <laughs> I absorbed it. However, I experimented too. Um, then, but the real charge was the following. I was the youngest member of the faculty, so it was my this job. This is the art department. This, now I was teaching at UCLA. Were included in your duties the uh, and then, need to install exhibitions? Then I installed ex exhibits, and which I loved doing because we'd have Korean pottery and, you know, just all kinds of things. And the um, director of the music of the department at that time was a very open-minded experimental person who had been to the Orient and was inv very much involved with art around the world and also was open to all kinds of experiments so one morning I was asked to come into the office and <clears throat> she said now Barbara I know that the trustees of the university will condemn me for even considering photography as art. However, I'm going to take the risk, and I think the young man whose work you will be hanging tomorrow is truly an artist, and I'm going to stand up for the possibility. Will you tell us who that person was? And this young man is Edward Weston. Well, now, at that time, his name didn't ring any bell, except to a very few people, and he had just returned from Mexico. So the next morning, here he came, we shook hands, and at that time, that was 1926, at that time, all the men on campus wore ties and so forth. Well, he was like the hippie of the day. He had a white shirt with short sleeves and a big open neck. He wore corduroy pants. So we shook hands, 
And then the moment we began getting the pictures out of the boxes, oh boy, it just hit me to the I'm very... What were those photographs? Well, um, a lot of the familiar ones, of course, today. He had just returned from Mexico. The, some were of, um, what was the woman, the wife of um, Diego Rivera? I can't I can't remember all those things. Sorry. Anyhow, I think the pepper was there and so on. Anyhow, the moment I saw it, I realized Willard is right. It can be art. And there was something that Edward Weston told you during the course Later. of those meetings. Yes. He became a close friend of yours, yes. didn't he? Yes together with Charles Sheeler as well? Oh, much later, Charles Sheeler, yes. But in those meetings with Weston, he used a phrase yeah. that has stuck with you for yes. all of your life. Can you yeah. tell us what yes. that was and why it was so yeah. influential? Well, we hung all these things over several hours. And um, <clears throat> the moment I saw them, especially the rhythm of the pepper and so forth, um, I thought if I ever, I mean, I didn't think, it just went through me like wildfire. If I ever photograph, my things have got to move. And, and then it just went like that. So then after it was all over and we'd hung it and we had a very fine relationship, I, he thanked me for helping me and I said, and I said it was a great pleasure and so forth. And then I said, and now I shudder to think how naive it sounded. And Mr. Weston, could you tell me what you're truly trying to do? And then he said, what I think I'm truly trying to do is to portray essence. And that just went into me like wildfire. <laughs> you still did not become a photographer, however. No, no. But you became a photographer's assistant for a while, and I'm thinking of the times that you worked uh, with your husband, helping him light the things that he photographed. I assume that was a very important influence well, on your own later work. Yes, I'll tell you how that worked. You see, Willard said, now I'll teach you photography if you'll teach me design and composition. And I said, well, I'll be happy to teach you composition and design, but I don't want to learn photography. That was before the Western experience. So I was already helping him with design, and he was trying to get me into it. So here's what I was doing for him. We both love Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture, and there's considerable of that in Los Angeles area. In fact, we knew some of the people who owned his homes, and even some that were being built. So Willard was very smart. Knowing that I did enjoy it and love it, <clears throat> he'd get me to come along with him so that I would set up the, I would make the final decision on the composition, see? Well, <clears throat> it augmented my interest because upside down, when you're looking through a five to seven camera, you're looking upside down. And I got a kick out of seeing Frank Lloyd Wright upside down, see? And so we had all kinds of wild, crazy experiences, I could tell you, all kinds of things. <clears throat> so I was really learning how to trigger the thing and all that, although I didn't intend to. <clears throat> but then the real way that I got into <clears throat> photography on a major scale was when each year, each summer, the, when the vacation period came, Willard and I would hop off to the southwest to Arizona, New Mexico <clears throat> for the three-month period. I would be painting because I was exhibiting in different societies and so forth. <clears throat> and he would be photographing and getting material to write about for his articles and magazines. So <clears throat> he would get me to wear a camera around my neck, no matter where I was, and said, well, even if you don't think you're a photographer, but just if you see a rattlesnake or something, just click the shutter. Well, <laughs> so we did all kinds of crazy things. Among your close friends, as we mentioned earlier, were Edward Weston and Charles Sheeler. Were they an influence on your work and on your style? Well, um, I'm, see, uh, to, get, to get into the Sheeler period, um, See, I 
taught there at the university for five years, and by that time, Willard had started to use the Leica camera, which was then a very strange little thing. And that was in 1928 that he started it. And by 1930, he had had so many articles in so many magazines using this funny little camera at that time that the like of people in New York had asked him to come back and have an office there where so he could describe to the many people that thought it was a funny little toy, but how do you do use it? So uh, we then came back to New York and started living in New York in 1930 and began to have many friends, of course, and Charles Sheeler was one of them. I would assume his work was particularly appealing because he too, of course, combined the Painting. life of a painter and yeah. a photographer and yeah. both with a distinction. Yeah. So he was one of our many dear friends. I was exhibiting my paintings and I was painting and so forth. Willard was doing all kinds of experimental things with the Leica. We, he was asked to give many lectures and we went all from Boston to Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. And he'd get me to come along and run the slides, of course. So I'd go to the museums and see the museums wherever we were while he was doing all the talking with all the people that wanted to know things. So then by 1932, we were getting along so very well, we decided it was time to have a child. So we had one. And then by 1935, we had another one. And at that time... We what were, happened to your work during the course of all Well, that's the whole point. Uh, if any of you here have that many child, children and want to paint, you'll know how difficult that one was. And I was just desperate because my children I adored and I would never do anything that would hurt them. But if I painted all day as I normally would, I would destroy the children. So I was just in the stage of desperation. So then Willard said, now look, Barbara, you are a photographer. You just don't acknowledge that you are. But since most photography is done actually in the dark room, I could be with the kids at night and you could be in the dark room at night. And so it was that or nothing. And so my children came first. Therefore, how can I, but how can I be a photographer? Well, of course I'd taken thousands of pictures for Willard, never considering myself a photographer. And of course I really did not. Also I was a design teacher and I knew how to design, so that was no problem. But how to adjust my whole life cycle with it. And um, then I began thinking, well, the only way I can be true to myself and feel honest, because I still knew that yes, photography is not simply clicking the shutter and stealing from fact, but I still had never really tried to convey my own concepts because I took thousands of pictures just for Willard. And he was more of a journalist type of writer. A large segment of your work is in photo montages. And I think you just said stealing from uh, nature, was it? Uh, you've used photo montage as social commentary. But I wonder if you would tell us what you mean when you say that photo montage is the only way to achieve complete honesty in photography. Well, maybe that's, maybe I was being a little bit over speaking there. Um, but I, there is an essence to that that you really do yeah. believe, and uh, tell us what that is. Well, of course, I'm not saying that that's the only way. It's just for me, it would be embarrassing for me to stand in front of something and just click it without conveying some additional subtle meaning, or not necessarily subtle, maybe obvious meaning. Thinking particularly of two images. One, I think, is Madison Square Park and another fossil formation that is a photograph of the skyline of the city at night, I think from 23rd Street, uh, and then has a shell fossil superimposed upon it. Mm -hmm. Can you describe perhaps those two images sure. and why you decided to put them together? Sure. Well, this one is the spring on Madison Square. 
and <clears throat> um, my studio was on 23rd Street on the fourth floor overlooking Madison Square. I had a big heap of negatives I was sorting. I just, this was in the period when I was photographing Martha Graham, which is another story. And here was a photograph of Eric Hawkins that I had just placed in a certain spot and I was really analyzing it, the movement and so on. At the same time when I look out there, I saw people, it was snowy, and people were staggering through the snow. At the same moment, the, a friend entered my studio carrying some, what are they, tulips, and said, spring is here, and dropped it on my table. And so then I just impulsively put the three ideas together, and that was that. And the fossil formation? I was in New York City all day, and there was so much racket. The ambulances were screaming and police whistles and everything. And I had done most of the day's work on the street, so I was just fed up with it. I came into, the, into my studio there and saw a little fossil about this big that a relative had sent to me from a glacier in Alaska and it was supposed to be 18 million years old. So I thought, ah, New York is turning into a fossil. <laughs> mm. And so I instantly remembered a, a negative that I had in my, what I call my component file. See, when I'm shooting various things, <clears throat> I usually take at least four pictures, even if I think I've got what I wanted the first first crack. And then if I think that then the ones that I discard, that if they have a, some future potential, I put it in my component file and I have hundreds of them there. <clears throat> so I instantly remembered the moment I saw the fossil. I remember this picture of New York at night when the Chrysler Tower was fairly new and I was attending a party on a very tall skyscraper and shot this picture. Then I, I grabbed this negative, which was a four by five <coughs> of the city, and I took a piece of paper <coughs> and laid it down and then drew a, an enlarged fossil where I wanted it to be. So then I took the little fossil, set up my camera, four by five camera, and enlarged it to that amount, shot it, and developed it, and then used the two as a sandwich. You said that some photographers use photographic elements plagiaristically, and others have done so legitimately. How do you draw the distinction between the two, and which painter's use of photography do you approve? <clears throat> um, well, if a photographer is, if a painter is going to use <clears throat> a photograph that he did not he or she did not take I think it's only honest to say uh, just as a writer would if a writer quotes from Shakespeare um, then that's okay but if he just uses Shakespeare and doesn't say Shakespeare I think it's uh, it's crooked and I think the same thing true with a, a painter manipulating a, from a like Warhol, I can't stomach that. <clears throat> uh, speaking of, uh, of other things that I think are, are not good, uh, one day, this, now I'm in Scarsdale and my kids were in school, and <clears throat> the school teacher came over, <clears throat> came over to me one afternoon after the kids were gone and said how disturbed she was over what was happening to the children from TV. She said, I feel that our children are being brainwashed. And so then I said, maybe I can think up some kind of a photomontage to do about it. So then I took a picture of her and then to show that she was brainwashed, first I had these light things to, in, to imply that, you know, something's entering your brain. And then, see, I've distorted her eye. And so I call it brainwashed. 
Well, I think maybe the closest to that is in my light drawings. My light drawing concept came just when I was concluding the designing of my Martha Graham book. This was a much later thing, of course, when I was doing photomontage. And the idea was the pure energy here, but neurotic man, the grabby person. And so the contrast between it. I guess it was almost 45 years ago when you met a then not widely discovered dancer called Martha Graham for the very first time. What were the circumstances of your meeting? What was she doing in 1935 and what were you doing? Could you describe that for us? At that time, Willard was doing all kinds of um, discussions for the like, like of people with people that were curious about the strange little camera. And one of the persons <clears throat> that he had worked with uh, on that purpose <clears throat> was a young filmmaker, Julian Bryan, who started the International Film Foundation, if you know anything about that. And we had become good friends. We lived in New York City, right near there, and <clears throat> many of these people that Willard worked with would come to our home and have discussions or have dinner and so forth. So <clears throat> he had just gotten married and had, and he and his wife, Marion, who taught it, who taught dance at Sarah Lawrence College, although I didn't know it at the time, um, were having dinner with us and we were celebrating. And then we got to saying, well, have you been looking at anything interesting lately? And, and I said, well, this terrific dance that I saw just knocked me out. It's so similar somehow um, with our Indian experience. And then Marion said, why, we know Martha. Uh, she comes out to discuss things with my students at Sarah Lawrence Dance Company. And um, tomorrow, Julian's going to be making a documentary film. Why don't you come along? And then they said, bring your Leica. <laughs> so, um, the next night, yes, we went to a rehearsal. It wasn't a serious thing. And Julian would be down in the aisle, grinding away, and I was up on the apron of the stage, and Martha, I had my Leica, and there were little moments when she had a, wasn't dancing. So we began to talk, and I said something like, um, we were deeply impressed by your beautiful dance, and I had the strange feeling that, wondering if there could be some connection to the Indian ritual in the Southwest. And she said, absolutely. That's one of the deep experiences of my life. And then without knowing what I was saying, I said, I would like to do a book on your work. And she said, I'll work with you. It was just, just like, like that. that. Your photographs are the only ones that exist of early Martha Graham dances. <sighs> Did you ever discuss certain movements or whole dances with Martha Graham before you photographed them? Always. I'd go to, no, I, I never did it commercially. I never did it in performance. I would go to many performances before I ever would tackle it. I would go, try to go to a small theater, go to a big theater, and see how the spatial environment of the stage affected or did it affect the uh, interpretation of the movement. And also, I would watch the lighting. A number of the photographs that you've done of Martha Graham are very widely pre reproduced. I assume the most renowned is Letter to the World. What is Martha Graham meant to portray in that image? Well, <clears throat> you, I'm sure you know something about Emily Dickinson. And that um, her love life wasn't working. And so therefore she was in agony. And then realized that her urge to make poetry uh, was her deepest urge and that that had no restrictions. In the kick, when she goes this way, it means she's giving in to reality, to tragedy. And I made her go right with the horizontal line of the background and, and it goes with her, the arm and her body and her jaw and everything con conveys that giving into reality. But the inner swerve of the 
sweep of the of the skirt is to portray the inner energy of imagination that you will know? ultimately become her poetry. Now, for people here in photography, I made all kinds of studies of timing. If I wanted to make her skirt terribly intense, it might have been, I would shot maybe at a ten thousandth or a thousandth of a second. But if I wanted it tense but fluent, I probably shot it at six hundredths of a second. Now, I had, in working on this whole energy factor, I made countless, countless experiments with the timing element. A ten thousandth, one thousandth, six hundredths, four hundredths, one hundredth, etc. And um, all through this whole thing, uh, every gesture is controlled by my awareness of the emotional impact that timing creates. And all of the gestures are with real meaning. I think that none of your images are without content. I'm thinking of the torso of Martha Graham that really ecstasis. signify ecstasis that signifies something very significant in her work and yours. Can you tell us about that? Well, um, sculpturally, of course, in art history, I've studied sculpture, of course, and um, Greek sculpture, especially, and so on. And um, in this, I, I, I wanted to have as much variety as possible, aesthetically and uh, emotionally, too. <clears throat> and so this, so many of her dances are of tragedy. Well, um, the drama, of course, is involved there. While the aesthetic sculptural quality of, oh, what's the name of it? I forget. Ecstasis. Ecstasis, yeah. Ecstasis was on the, the um, positive side. And so we go from positive to negative and back and forth and movement to tranquility and so on. Well, since the body was actually not moving in this case, but I wanted to, to give the sense of rhythm nevertheless. So I made it as sculptural as possible, but at the same time emphasized the subtlety of the, te of the texture of the garment in it. And uh, to make it more sculptural, I simply chopped off her head and feet. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara Morgan, for being part of today's program. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Visions and Images, American Photographers on Photography. Mm -hmm.